Good morning, everyone. How are you? How was the past week? Well, I praise God that uh, I, I was able to rest last Sunday. Pastor Nikki preached here. And it was time for me to visit my doctors, my eye doctor, my urology, urologist, my pulmonary doctor. And if you remember, three months ago, I urinated blood, right? And I was under observation for three months. And the results were very good you know, when I got it last, uh, last week. Only that my prostate gland, glands have uh, doubled in size. And uh, also my eyes, sabi ng eye doctor ko, that's seen for a year and daming tama ng mga mata mo. You know? And mm, ang grado ko has doubled also. 125, now 250. Pero bagay ba? Sana bago po salamin mo, Pastor Pog. Pog. Yeah. And uh, also, my pulmonary doctor, uh, my chest x-ray, it's good. So he just wants, she just wants me to rest down my, my voice for a month. Hindi naman po pwede, no? wala sa pastor. So, ayun. Uh, and a special announcement, next Sunday, I'm going to co-officiate the wedding of our two young pros, our two servants, uh, Gideon and Gly, Gideon and Gly. Yay! So, praise the Lord. All right, so we continue with our study of uh, chapters 12 to 16 of uh, Romans. And uh, today, we take up Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 11. You know, when sin entered this world, the immediate result was to damage relationships. Because of sin from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were instantly separated from the fellowship of God that they had enjoyed. And guilt prompted them to hide from Him. Sin is sin. And uh, sin, its consequence, must run its course. And so Adam and Eve were uh, cast out from the holy presence of God. So you see, sin always damages relationships. And by now, perhaps you have been reminded of conflicts, unresolved or not, that damage your relationship, your own relationships to a lot of people. And so the, the whole trust of the Bible is for us to know, to, it's to show us how to have a right relationship with God and how to love Him with our total being and to love others as we in fact love ourselves. But we must first understand we cannot love God first as we are unable to love Him because of sin. So it's important that we must know that God loved us first. And then accepting and believing the gospel reconciles us to God and floods our hearts with His love so that we can begin the lifelong battle of loving Him and others more and more. You see, it's a lifelong battle. Because of the indwelling sin, our default mode is selfishness. To secure our self first, our interests first, our feelings first, rather than sacrifice ourselves in love for God and others. So the Christian life is a constant battle of dethroning self and enthroning Christ. It is a fight within us and tested and seen in our relationship. Am I growing in sincere love from my heart, from the heart, for my family, for fellow believers and unbelievers that I know and have contact with? Sincere, true, honest, unpretentious love how do you measure your sincerity with God and others? Can you ask the person beside you how? It's, easily, it's easy to pretend and fake it. But sincere love for God spills over into sincere love for others. You see, at first glance, our passage this morning seems to be an unconnected series of commands. Just like a... a Ragbag of miscellaneous exhortations. But upon a closer look or evaluation, it reveals to us that these verses flesh out what love looks like in a Christian family. And the theme 
of our passage this morning is uh, not hard to find. Love must govern all our relationships. Love must govern all our relationships. And John Stott calls this the recipe of love. Before we look at the ingredients of love, may I request everyone to please rise as we read our passage this morning. It's found in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 11. Let's read this all together. Let love... You may be seated. This is God's holy and inspired word may add blessing to it. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, and we thank you for your word. And we ask now that you not only enable us by your spirit to understand it clearly, but that you would work its reality in our hearts. We confess right now that we have not loved you as we ought, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves nor have we loved our Christian brothers and sisters as we should have. So we pray that by your Spirit, you would change us, transform us, and amend us by your grace. Empower me. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Are we a loving people? Yeah. Tanungin nyo nga yung katabi mo. Mapagmahal ka ba? You know, the commands of these verses are built on the foundation of Romans 12, 1 and 2. Let's read again, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Thank you. Paul is showing us the practical outworking of verses 9 to 21, built on verses 1 and 2. And at the heart, at the heart of everything, are the mercies of God in saving us. That's why Paul devoted the previous 11 chapters talking about salvation, talking about doctrines of sin, of sovereignty of God, of salvation. Spelling out to us in detail what is God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. In loving relationships with Him, and now with each one, with one another, as a result of His grace in saving us. Now, before we proceed to work through our text, let me remind you or let us take note of uh, what love is throughout the New Testament. No? Love is not an uncontrollable feeling that comes over you once in a while. Love is not an uncontrollable feeling that comes over you once in a while. Remember, it is a commandment that we have to obey. Because it is not our nature to love the Christian way, the biblical way. The Lord Jesus made this explicit in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And therefore, we can define biblical love based on Christ's self-sacrificing love on the cross. Biblical love now, this is biblical love. It is only, not only for us, but for couples. It is a self-sacrificing, caring commitment. Remember, that shows itself. Hindi lang sinasabi. It shows itself in seeking the highest good of the one love. Gideon, Gly. A self-sacrificing, caring commitment that shows itself in seeking the highest good of the one 
love. If you are not seeking to live out this kind of love, then you are disobeying God. Loving God and not loving others is a sin. By the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit in us, then we can choose to sacrifice our own self-interest for others' sake that they may be conformed to the image of God. That's the highest good of, every, of anyone, that they may be conformed to the image of God. Now, let me balance what I've said. It may not be for a person's highest good to dole out money to him to, because we are in, enabling him to continue his undisciplined way of spending or perhaps his uh, lazy way of life. Or perhaps we are enabling him to continue his dependence on alcohol and drugs. And therefore, the highest good here is to confront him of his sin. And to teach him biblical principles of stewardship. And how to budget his, uh, his money and how to spend his money. So, you see, the highest good of the person. It, it includes confronting a person with his sin. Because the aim of biblical love is to grow in godliness. I know it's hard. But you know what? The first fruit that results from walking in the Spirit is love. So let us look at the ingredients of love, biblical love, in the first two verses that we're going to study. This is from verses 9 to 16. So it's divided into three. So you have to be here every Sunday so you will know the recipe of love. Now, biblical love must be without hypocrisy. Paul would not have written these unless he knew that there is a strong tendency for people, even believers, to put on a mask of love to cover their hearts that, is, that are filled with manipulation, apathy, selfishness, hatred, and even jealousy. Think of it. Of all the things that Paul could have written about love, love is good, love is enjoyable, love is bold, love is constant, love is wonderful, love is beautiful, love is a, a, a splendor, Me, uh, love is a many splendor thing. But he said, let love be without hypocrisy. Why is that even on his mind? I believe it's because of verse 3. It's the dead opposite of verse 3. Verse 3 reads, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So our worship of God is seen primarily in our relationship. The way we love God and the, le the way we love one another. And since we are born with pride, and this world, the flesh, and the devil are filled with pride, this is not an easy task. That we are not to think highly of ourselves, but we have to think by faith that everything comes from God. Our very own existence. Our deliverance from eternal punishment. Our giftedness. Both the natural and supernatural gifts. And that we are to give glory and honor and thanksgiving to Him for everything. We are not to let our opinion of ourselves exceed the bounds of modesty. We are not to have a hyper opinion of ourselves. Ready, Bayon? Not to think highly of ourselves. You see, hypocrites are to totally concerned about themselves. How will I appear? Is this driving question. How can I create a good impression of me? Is this consuming desire? 
I am better than the rest, is his confidence. And he puts down others who are not like him. Now, hypocrisy shows itself in two forms or two ways. One, it tries to make the outside look better than the inside. We put forward what looks like a loving behavior that doesn't really signify what we really feel inside. Oh, if we can just see, show a video of how we talk of someone behind his or her back. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 that we are like clanging cymbals. There's no love. In verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 13, he says, And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So you can do some remarkable acts of sacrifice, external sacrifice, and have not love. And have not love. The classic statement of this form of hypocrisy is found in Matthew 15, 7 to 8, where Jesus said, You hypocrites! Well, did I say a prophesy of you when he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. External lip praise that wasn't accompanied by internal heart praise. Jesus called that hypocrisy. So the first way that hypocrisy shows itself is when we hide internal sin and put up a moral external front. And the other way is this. We hide our own flaws, sometimes even from ourselves, by drawing attention to other people's flaws so that ours don't show up so clearly. And this, the classic example of this is, do you remember the story of... Uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector. You can see that in Luke chapter 18, 9 to 14. I won't read the verses anymore to save us of time. But that's the classic example. Remember? The, the Pharisee, Ay, salamat, di ako ganyan, hindi ako ganyan. But the Lord exalted the one, the, the, the tax collector. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you praise the person to his face and ran him down on his back, you're not practicing biblical love. Iba sa harap. Iba pag nakatalikod. Gusto niyo po bang kasama mga taong ganun? Would you like to be with people? With, with hypocrites? Biblical love is without hypocrisy. It is sincere. You see, hypocrisy is all about falsehood. It's about the deception. It's about hiding concealment. But love, biblical love, is sincere. Hypocrisy is the opposite of loving the truth. Grace and truth, truth and love, they always go together. So Paul reminds us, let love be without hypocrisy. It has to be genuine. It has to be real to be sincere. Nakaharap man o nakatalikod, pareho lang. Walang ikahihiya. Second, that we see in the second half of verse 9, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. In the Greek text, abhor and cling are participles that show how love without hypocrisy operates. Abhorring what is evil and clinging to what is good. In other words, biblical love is discerning. It never endorses or aligns itself or encourages others' behavior or attitude. That is evil. Rather, it embraces what is good in God's sight. And what is that? The good, the acceptable, and perfect will. Love hates evil. Think about that. Oftentimes, we think of love as a feel-good emotion that causes us to lose our sense of right and wrong. But that is not biblical love. Mommy, kaya nangyari sa kasi love na love ko siya. Young people, 
ilang beses na sinasabi, do not be unequally yoked. Kasi love na love ko siya. We cannot love God and love evil at the same time any more than loving money and loving God at the same time. So you see, Paul's words obviously imply that there is an objective, knowable standard of what is good and evil. And he has revealed that sense of right and wrong in his holy word. And this standard doesn't change with the times and with the different cultures. Read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll fall in love with Jesus. And you'll desire to love like He does. And you'll desire to be compassionate like He is. Now, I want you to note also that Paul says, he doesn't say, he doesn't just say, avoid evil. He says, abhor evil. We are to hate or to detest it. Abhor is an emotional reaction. It is an emotional reaction, brothers and sisters in Christ, against all, against everything that displeases God. It is an emotional reaction against everything that displeases God. If you're entertained by green jokes, dirty jokes, you don't abhor evil. If you watch malalaswang shows, you don't abhor evil. And the opposite of abhorring evil is to cling to what is the verb cling to literally is to be glued to, to be epoxized. The good is God's good, acceptable, and perfect will, His moral will, which is revealed in His Word. Now, to cling to what is good before God, as revealed in His Word, and not to cling to what is good according to your own opinion. There's a big difference. To cling to what is good before God according to His Word, according to His revealed Word, and not to cling to what is good according to your own opinion. At dito pumapasok yung kampi-kampihan. You know, there's a, there's a biblical principle that we're always been tested. This church has always been tested. 1 Timothy 5.19 That we are not to entertain accusations against an elder or a pastor without two or three witnesses. Diba? We've, we've studied this for several months. That if someone comes to you and talks uh, again and, and has an accusation against a pastor or an elder, if he doesn't have two or three witnesses, who are we going to entertain? No. No. You know, Ineng and I, 20 years ago, that's why I said, little did I know that I would encounter this every time. Ineng and I had an, an experience. A woman came to her, and she told her that she had an affair, a one-night affair with a pastor. And Ineng and I sinned, because we entertained. No? We entertained. For three months, we've been praying. We prayed for this, and I confronted the pastor. The pastor, binaliktad kami. And there was a, she even, uh, he even uh, accused us of wolves in sheep's clothing. We went to the denomination and there, is, there are members here in the church who were once members of that denomination. And they know the story. And you know what the, the, the committee told us? The 20 pastors do you have two or three witnesses? We don't have. Even though we had so many evidences, we have, uh, they, they, they uh, rode on a ship, cabin, di ba dalawahan? So kung apatan and animan, 
can the woman knock at the door of the of the pastor if there are four people there? So definitely dalawa lang sila. And the pastor reimbursed yung kanyang ticket came in for two. So we had a, we had a, the evidence. And the the woman said, "Remember pa, remember doc, I was I wasn't the pastor then. Remember doc, you were the one who brought us to the pier." Ako naghatid. At silang dalawa lang. But the denomination told us, we will throw this in the trust can. You don't have two or three witnesses. Iyak kami ni Ining. But you know what? After a year, the pastor was caught with the members of, some members of that committee, with someone, with a girl, with a woman. Holding hands in the mall. And they approached the pastor and said, Hey, pastor. And the pastor said, Ah, my, my sister. They didn't, you know, they didn't uh, make a gulu there. But the next day, they asked the pastor, the chairman of the board, or the committee, Pastor, can you bring your, your, your sister to the, to the office? Umalis nagtiwalag. What am I saying? If the elder or the pastor is guilty of the accusation, mananagot siya sa Panginoon. God will reveal it in time. Our accountability with God is higher. So if this is the command, do not entertain an accusation against a pastor or an elder without two or three witnesses, then, sorry, you don't have to talk about it. That's the command. But if not, imagine it's so easy to destroy us. Several weeks ago, Ineng talked to some classmates of hers sa seminary. And you know, they said, ang daming sinasabi sa asawa mo. But we are not to defend ourselves. It is God who will defend us. And if we are wrong, God will punish us. Okay? Loving God and fearing Him are the only basis for proper disgust and hate, hatred of evil. It is only to the degree that we love Him for the beauty of His holiness that we can abhor evil and cling to what is good. It is only to the degree that we love Him according to the beauty of His holiness, that we can abhor evil and cling to what is good. Proverbs 8.13 reads, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. Third, in the first half of verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. The word that was used is Philadelphia. It's a Greek joined together, philos. It's a Greek word which means tender affection, fondness, devotion. I look at the word affection. No? You know, it means intestines. Imagine, uh, Brother Ed, I love you with all of my intestines. Ganun kita mahal. Tignan mo ang aking mga atay. Ganun. Di ba? And Adolphus usually translated brother, but it literally means one born of the same womb. All Christians have been born on the same womb, of the same womb, through the new birth. It is easy to understand that early Christians adopted this word to describe Christian love. The Lord Jesus Christ says, <coughs> be born again. And to be born again is to receive the new birth through personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it means to be born of God's womb. Now, again, this is a command, brotherly affection. It is not just a suggestion that you try this when you are in a good mood. No. No, the command is to love one another in the New Testament or how we are to love one another in the body of Christ, not just to bless those who curse us, not just to pay, pray for those who treat us badly, not, us, not only to return good for evil, not only to do what uh, you want them to do unto you, 
There is more to the command. We are to feel affection. Mula sa loob. A tender affection of each other, for each other. Now, when I researched on this, alam nyo, I was shocked. Here, even, for it, no, brothers and sisters, couples, okay? That we will never say a word or lift a finger to harm a brother or a sister. Man of this congregation, how do you treat your wife? This is also included. Never to say a word or lift a finger to harm a brother or a sister. We are there to protect what will be for his best. Either we are in good mood or not. Very difficult. But this is because of biblical love. It's easier to, to retaliate those who have wrong, wrong us. Diba? But biblical love. No? You have to practice biblical love. It's very painful to love, especially when the person goes around every corner talking to everyone, this maligning you and discrediting you. But remember, God is always so- is sovereign. May katapusan din. Tender family affection among believers is very important because it bears witness to the truth that our God is Father. And God is love. It is His nature. The church is not a human organization or a social club. It is primarily family of God. Do you consider Him or her a family? Parang... <sighs> John says in verse, thir- in verse 35 of chapter 13, By these all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, to be a Christian means to be born the second time into the family of God. Amen? So you see, love is not just a mere word. It's a spectacular reality. God, you know, takes this seriously, this truth that His children, all His children, are brothers and sisters. They have one father, one homeland. And God says, there is a way that my children should feel to one another. And that is a tenderly affectionate, tender affection for one another. Tender affection. For one another. We are committed to love one another as a witness that indeed this is what a family of God should, li- should be like. We love each other, protect what is the good of each other. In truth, in truth, it's hard. Sometimes it really hurts. And the second half of verse 10, give preference to one another in honor. The Greek word translated give preference to means to lead or go before. That set an example. You be a model. Don't wait around for people to recognize your contribution and praise you. Don't wait around for people to recognize your contribution and praise you. Instead, you are to be conscious to be alert of, that, of, of what the person is contributing and give him honor. Easily said, but hard to practice. But we need to be clear here that Paul is not saying that we are to neglect our knowledge, our abilities, our talents, and practice a kind of false humility. Oh, I am nobody. I am nothing. Don't regard what I say. No, because that would... Be in conflict with, again, verse 3, that we are to think with sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. But when Paul says, give preference to one another in honor, he doesn't mean that we would deny knowledge, abilities, and our talents. Rather, he means that we should have a true estimate of ourselves. So we should not overestimate 
ourselves and underestimate others. And lastly, in verse 11, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Paul's words here have nothing to do with how loud we sing, how much we clap our hands, or either we are going to raise our hands or not, or sway our hips in worship. Those are just secondary, secondary things. Paul is challenging every one of us to put, to exert an effort into Christianity just as you do in your work. Can I repeat that? Paul is challenging you and me to put much effort into Christianity as we do in our work. The Amplified Bible touches its uh, uh, meaning very well. Never lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor. Be aglow and burning with the Spirit, serving the, the Lord. Now, the phrase, be aglow and burning with the Spirit refers to a boiling pot. Serve the Lord with zeal and boiling intensity. Serve the Lord with zeal and boiling intensity. Kumukulo ba ang inyong paglilingkod sa Panginoon? Does this describe me? You ask yourself, Kumukulo ba ako sa pagkanta sa Panginoon? Kumukulo ba ako sa pagtugtog sa Panginoon? Kumukulo ba ako sa pagtuturo sa Sunday School sa Panginoon? Kumukulo ba ako as an usher? Kumukulo ba ako sa men's ministry? Sa women's ministry? I heard that the core group will, will have a meeting that they will revive our women's ministry. Kumukulo ba ako? Tingnan nyo, kapain nyo nga. Mapapaso ba kayo doon sa katabi nyo? Kumukulo sa paglilingkod sa Panginoon. That is what Paul is telling us. So I must ask myself, and I ask you to ask yourselves as well, does this describe me? Am I lagging behind in diligence? Am I lazy in serving the Lord? Am I indifferent in the cause of my Lord and my Master who bought me with His blood? Perhaps some of you are thinking, you know, Pastor, I have been diligent and I, I, I was fervent in serving the Lord before. But I burnt out. Because others criticized me. Because someone spread rumors, bad rumors about me. Because they didn't appreciate how the, the long and hard hours of working behind the sin. So I don't feel like going through that anymore. I'll just attend church and live, but I don't want to get involved in serving. My friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you feel like that, you need to refocus your mind. Refocus your mind and get the proper motivation to serve. And Paul has laid it down in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. By the mercies of God. That should be your motivation to serve. By the mercies of God. Hindi ako karapat dapat. But He chose me. He saved me. Dapat dito ako sa hell. Karapat dapat ako sa hell. Pero dito ka. Kung tunay ka mananampalataya, heaven! The supreme motivation to sacrifice, transform life, service, are the mercies of God. May I ask you, do you work hard to serve the Lord? Maybe you're thinking, you know, Pastor, I've got to work hard to earn a living. And after work, I'm really so tired to serve. 
allow me to respond by giving two comments. First, you should view your work as service unto the Lord and therefore do it heartily as unto Him. Paul says in Colossians 3, 23, 24, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if those words applied, I'm sorry, wala siya sa PowerPoint, but if those words applied to slaves who had the most menial jobs imaginable, then these words apply to you and your job. And therefore, our mindset should be this work. I am serving the Lord. And so, do not be lazy. Work hard. Because you're doing it for the Lord. And secondly, God has given you spiritual gifts to be used in serving Him. And when you use those gifts to serve His kingdom, He energizes you with His power. May I repeat that? God has given you spiritual gifts to be used in serving Him. And if you use that gift, He energizes you with His power. Paul says, For this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. Of course, we need to evaluate how much we are able to commit to. We disqualify ourselves if we neglect our family responsibilities in 1 Timothy 3, 4-5. And we will not be as effective if we take on so much that we neglect our own souls. You know, it happened to me more than 10 years ago. I had 17 Bible studies and I thought I was doing well. But I have neglected my soul. And God said, stop! And for three years, I was in a deep pit only between me and God. And I thank the Lord that He gave me another chance to speak before you, to preach. We will not be effective if we take on so much that we neglect our souls, that we have been so busy with the kingdom and not to Him. But, when you do what God has gifted you to do to serve His purpose, His power energizes you. The power that He supplies, it energizes you. You may be so tired at the end of the day, but you are deeply satisfied. Parang walang amen. Amen. Tama. You will be so tired. And when, you know, especially the workers of the church. I know. At the end of the day, we say, I'm so tired. But di ba? It's so sarap. Na ma-feel mo, na pagod ka for the Lord. Palagi ka naman pagod. Sino hindi palaging pagod? Every day, you're always pagod. You're always tired. Kaya nga sarap matulog. Hindi ba masarap mapagod? Para sa Panginoon. Amen? Amen. And so the mercies of God... Call out, serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. All believers are called on to serve the Lord. You see, Paul wrote this letter to Christians at Rome, not only to pastors, not only to church leaders, all Christians, not only those who are full-time workers, are to be serving the Lord in some capacity. We studied this last Sunday when Paul develops that analogy of Christ and the body of the church or the body of Christ the church and the body of Christ every part of the body is vital it's useful for its functioning the proper functioning of the body and every one of us has been given a spiritual gift at least one to be used to build up the kingdom the body of Christ if you're not serving the Lord then you are sinning. Because He's given you a gift. Well, so if you're not serving the Lord now, you need to ask, Lord, how can I serve you? And then begin doing it. 
We have so many things, many ministries here. We need people who will pray. Every, do you know that we have prayer cells? And somebody's praying there pag may service para hindi mabulul si pastor? So that we can feel the presence of God. We have so many, many ministries that we can be, that, that, that we can uh, serve. And then, we serve the Lord as His slaves and not volunteers. I know this is hard, but I have to say this. The Greek word for serve means to be enslaved. Since the Lord bought us with His blood, out of the slave, slave market of sin, then we are not our own. We belong to Him as His slaves. Everything that we are and all that we have is His and not ours. And therefore, our time is not ours that we can use as we please. Our money is not ours that we can spend as we please. Our careers are not ours, that we can pursue as we wish. Our families are not ours, that they can take priority over allegiance to the Lord. Everything that we are, all that we are, everything that we have, belongs to the Lord. You see, there is a fundamental difference between a slave and a volunteer. Volunteers choose how and when to serve. Slaves are on call 24-7, even if they don't feel like serving. Volunteers can quit anytime if they're tired. Slaves are slaves all of their lives. Well, the master can change their duties, but they are not free to quit. Volunteers have certain expectations. They expect that they are to be treated with respect. They expect that they have work, proper working conditions and considerations for their needs. They expect to be honored for their service. But servants, slaves, don't have any such expectations. Do you view yourself as a slave of Christ? Do you view yourself as a slave of Christ? It's harsh. But remember the alternative. If you are not a slave of Christ, then you are enslaved to Satan and sin. Jesus is a caring, loving master and never abuses his slave. Satan is a conniving, self-serving tyrant who abuses, who has no concern for his slaves. It is far, far better to be Christ's slave than to be enslaved to Satan and sin. Now, let me give you a word of caution in serving our master. It is easy for Christians to fall into this mindset where it becomes my ministry. It brings fulfillment. My whole identity is tied up with my ministry. I love, Pastor, the feeling of significance whenever I help out. I love the praises of people that they give when I serve them. Of course, there is great joy in serving the Lord and there is a legitimate sense of fulfillment when God uses you to serve others. But we need to beware of serving ourselves rather than serving the Lord. It sets you up to getting disappointed and frustrated and hurt when you do not get the praises and affirmations that you seek. Serving the Lord means that we are not serving ourselves. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is my prayer that we are all going to practice biblical love. A self-sacrificing, caring commitment that shows itself in seeking the highest good 
of the one you love. Amen? Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. And we ask, so oh God, that you teach us to love each other as you love us. And help us, Lord, to practice biblical love. Empower us. And it's also a time, Lord, for us to reflect that part of that love, Lord, that ingredient is for us to serve you. I pray, Lord, for those who are not yet in service, those who have not counted themselves as soldiers, as slaves of Christ, I pray that they will seek and ask, O oh God, to be of use, to use their gifts for you and you alone, for your glory. Is our prayer in Jesus' name? Amen.